It's a topic being discussed across the country, and tonight we'll examine Siouxland. Join Tim Seaman and Sophie Erber as they talk live with experts about where we were, where we are, and how we compare to other parts of the country. Race Relations in Siouxland, a candid conversation, starts now. And good evening. Thanks for being with us for this KCAU 9 Digital Town Hall Race Relations in Siouxland. It's a candid conversation. I'm Tim Seaman. And I'm Sophie Erber. Throughout the summer, events here in Siouxland, as well as across our nation, have put the spotlight really on race relations. Over the next half hour, we hope to take a closer look now at what exactly that looks like right here in Siouxland. And to help us do that, we are joined by three folks tonight who work in the area of race or community relations on a daily basis. Joining us tonight are Dr. Laura Laura Renee Chandler. She is director at the Center for Diversity and Community. And we're going to we want to back up here because our images don't match the names. Uh, Unity in the Community is a community based organization that partners with local law enforcement as well as other groups for educational purposes and information awareness for a conflict resolution. And uh, Cliff Coleman is with us with from that agency tonight. That's right, and uh, as is Denise Aspasia from the Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Sioux City. She serves as a bilingual therapist there. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for our viewers as well. And Dr. Chandler there in the middle is with us tonight, as I mentioned, as uh, well as we've gotten everybody introduced now, although we didn't get it off quite as uh, well as we would have hoped for. It is live, folks. That is indeed <laughs> the case. And before we go any further, we do want to remind you that we hope that we'll hear from our viewers tonight as well. Let us know what questions that you have by submitting a question to Facebook. Uh, that's facebook.com slash KCAU9 News. And we'll try to have our guests answer your questions or comments during the town hall. That's right. Now let's take a look at some of Siouxland's diversity, really. According to the U.S. Census, the Sioux City metro area breaks down like this. People who identified as white make up roughly 69% of the Sioux City population there. Also, uh, Hispanic people are the second highest group at 19%. Black and African American make up roughly 4.5% of the metro, while 3.5% are people of Asian descent. Native Americans, Alaska Natives, and Pacific Islanders equal two and a half percent. And again, as we get to the group here, I want to go around the horn one more time to make sure we get everybody a proper uh, introduction. Denise Espathia is nearest to me. Uh, Dr. Chandler is there in the middle, and Cliff Coleman is with us on the far side of the room. And again, we want to thank all of those folks for being with us tonight. Let's just start with and get a quick opinion from all of you. How would you describe uh, relays, community relations inside our Sioux City, our Siouxland area? You talk about you know, southeast South Dakota, northeast Nebraska here in Siouxland, and... and uh, Denise, let's just start with you. Um, I think we have a diverse community. Um, like the statistics says, we do have different backgrounds and um, I've been in the area for at least 20 years and um, the society area for at least 20 years. And I, and I think our, our mixes of races are, are growing and they keep growing. We have different um, populations um, or different cultures coming to our area. Dr. Chandler, how would you describe uh, the, the community that we live in? I think that this is a, a community of great opportunity. And, and I agree with Denise. I think it's been diverse for a very long time. Um, now and, and going back even to when this area was just a territory. There are different people of different cultures and different races who have moved and lived through this area. Um, and I think it's also a story that is being written as we speak. You know, so in the area where I live, 40% um, of children in the school K through 12 school district are, are um, young people of color. And so very soon they'll be living and working and raising families here. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see how our communities continue to change. Cliff, what about here in, in Sioux City itself? Well, Sioux City, uh, I've been here like 15 years, and uh, I, I agree with the ladies here. It, um, is, is, is diverse and is constantly, constantly growing. Uh, you got people from uh, different countries and different states, different ethnicities, and, and it's just growing. So, which that's a good thing. That's a, that's a real good thing. So, yeah, um, it's, it's, it's very diverse. And how would you say we all get along these days in brief? Cliff, we'll just go back around the horn going the opposite way. Well, I, for me, uh, from, from my perspective, I think it's half and half. Uh, I would say it's half and half, 50-50. You know, here in Siouxland, but, you know, uh, across the nation, you know, is, it, it varies, you know, uh, especially in the South, you know, because I'm originally from the South. And, 
it's, it's been divided a long time. But I would say it's 50-50. I, I think we have some work to do. Uh, I think that um, there are ways in which our communities are very welcoming and very inclusive. Um, but I do think we tend to think about race relations just in terms of interpersonal relationships. But there are other dimensions to think about as well. You know, access to health care, access to education, um, access to job opportunities. You know, that's another way to measure, you know, how well a community is doing in terms of race relations. And uh, I think that needs to be more of the conversation. Denise, at Catholic Charities, you see folks from many different avenues. How would you describe the way we get along? I think I would agree. I mean, we still have work to do. Um, there's not many opportunities even for I mean, people of color, but we we do have, we see, I remember since when I was here as younger to now, the community is getting better um, because of more opportunities for people of color like us, um, but we need to do some work as well. Now, I am, I'm new to the region, new to the Siouxland area, and, and like you, I spent a lot of my childhood growing up in the South in Florida, but was born in a very diverse community in the Northeast, in New York, New Jersey. Um, and I find myself in a region like Siouxland, and to me, um, there isn't a whole lot of at least visible diversity. Um, and therefore, you know, you have to then question, are we in somewhat of a bubble when you look at things going on on a national TV? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the race protests, things like that going on, and, um, you know, police uh, injustice, a lot of people marching against nationwide. So here, in Siouxland because we are in this community that you know I think we can all agree it's a very safe place to live mm -hmm. and raise a family mm -hmm. what do you think um, you know people here really see as a as a major difference why are race relations at least we can say better than in some of those um, larger areas I, I'll go around the room yeah. to whoever wants to start really well I was I would say um, a lot I see a lot of uh, community participation here you know, from from where I from from, from where I'm from, uh, back then you didn't see a whole lot of that. At least I didn't. But I I think it's different here because you got a lot of community organiza organizations. You got people coming together. Um, you know, stuff that I didn't see too much when I came here. When I saw that, it was more of a shock to me. I'm like, wow, they really come together here. And so a uh, lot of good influence. Yes, you have some bad. Yes, you do. And like the lady say, we still need some work. But I think overall is what makes Sioux City stand out is that people are participating in the community, loving one another. See, that's where it all starts, you know, loving one another and seeing people as God see them. You know what I'm saying? I'll jump in quickly. I agree with you there. Yeah. A lot of places, especially in larger cities, you don't feel that community support, right. that people really mm -hmm. care about where they live. So that, mm -hmm. as you well pointed out, is a, is a positive. H how about you, Dr. Chandler? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. We have three Southerners here. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm from North Carolina originally. Okay. And I've, you know, I'm living here going on eight years now and didn't imagine I would be here this long. But I found you know, relationships and institutions mm -hmm. and opportunities here that, that have kept me here. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting to me as a Southerner that many people will say, well, you must be so happy to be here and out of the South, right? And, and we, we tend to, when we think about negative racial relationships, there is so much of a focus on the South and not on some of the issues that may exist here. Um, we do live in, in bubbles, as you say. There, there is a lot of segregation here in, in communities, actually more so um, than other regions around the country. Uh, we tend to live around people who are like us. We work with people who are like us. Those are who our, our friends are. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, um, we do live very separate lives, but, um, you know, I, I think that there's a lot of work that can be done here. And, and um, you know, we're fortunate that we don't have some of the crises that we've seen in other regions of the country. And so we have the luxury of, you know, having conversations about our relationships and things that we can do mm -hmm. in the absence of crisis. And I think that that means that we should really get to work. I couldn't agree more with you that, you know, our community, yes, is, you know, like a bubble, but it's, um, we tend to, um, if somebody's in need, we get together, you know, and that's, I think, the, the need of the society that, yes, we're, um, can say some, for some people who are leaving the rural, being like, society being a big city, but it's not, it's, it's a small community that is willing to help and is willing to have this type of topics to mm -hmm. talk about it. And you've all mentioned, too, um, the work that can be done. Maybe for, for our viewers um, joining us online right now, just some of the specifics. It um, doesn't have to be hyper-specific, but some of the things you say, there's work to be done. What, 
what can we do tomorrow? What do we do to bring people out of these bubbles and, and, and get to know each other better? It, as we were talking about it, it crossed my mind. While we have a diverse community, we don't have large groups of diversity. Does that impact right. people that they are more likely to stay in that small bubble? And, and back to her question, just whoever would like to jump in. Yeah. Um, so I think it's about, you know, in terms of work that we need to do, that's where we really need to understand things like systemic racism and institutional racism. Um, those are things that are not necessarily overt. It's not about someone mistreating you, but it's in laws and policies and practices that are embedded within our institutions that lead to disproportionate impacts um, within our communities. So if we think about mass incarceration, right, rates of incarceration for people of color in the Midwest are higher than they are for other regions of the country. Uh, when it comes to access, of health, uh, access to health care, infant mortality rates, are worse here for people of color than they are in other regions of the country. Um, uh, college education attainment, degree attainment is lower, right? And so, and these are things that are not, uh, it's not a pathology within these communities, it's not a cultural problem within these communities, that there is a history of exclusion that is continuing to produce these, these outcomes. And so we need to think about, you know, who we're electing, who our elected officials are, um, what kind of policies have been in place in terms of education and housing, um, and what things we can change. So get out and vote, a message for our, yes. our viewers tonight. Yes, I was just about to say that. Get out yeah. uh, voting uh, is very important uh, because it impacts, the, impacts uh, the community, you know. So, and also too, um, we have to reach out. We have to reach out even to people that don't like us. Mm -hmm. I know that's hard, but it's doable because I do it all the time. So we have to reach out. Uh, we have to show people that we care. That's where, that's where it starts. Um, reach out to people that you don't know uh, because some people come here from different places, uh, you know, staying in that bubble or whatever because they don't know, they don't know the culture or, or whatever. So we reach out to them, talk to them, and that's when it's going to have to take some listening and understanding so that way we can be able to understand and have an open-minded conversation uh, and, and including what, what the ladies were saying here. And I'm also um, to be part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Be sitting in those meetings, you yeah. know, it's important to be sitting in the meetings, these type of meetings, um, the city hall meetings, you know, be part of the community as well as the women of color. You know, be sitting in like the school board, what's happening with our students, what, what can we do better within the school? What can we do better for victims of domestic violence or sexual assault? Be part of, mm -hmm. you know, those conversations that there are gonna be hard, like yeah. you, you said, yeah. there are gonna be topics that nobody probably wanted to talk about or they're, you know, mm -hmm. taboo, but we need to be, we need to bring those up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cliff, I'm curious. Uh, talk about unity in the community for just a second. It's a local um, community-minded um, bonding building group. I'm curious from when it started or in the very early years to today, how much more likely are you to see folks come out? I can only imagine at the beginning it was like, well, I don't know if I really want to venture out of that. Right. But I'm, I know that it has grown in popularity and it's doing very good work in our community. So how would you talk about that, that growth? Well, uh, we started in 2016, been four years ago, fast four years. Uh, and what we did, we just, we just reached out. We reached out to the law enforcement because, you know, they had a bad name at the time. So uh, we reached out to them. Uh, we started working together. And in a short time, we progressed. It grown so fast because of meetings like this, uh, getting to know people, going out into the community uh, and, and, and stuff like that and partnering. We got partnership with law enforcement, you know, along with love, prayer, hope and peace, you know, so all that worked together. And, and, and it's been growing and uh, a lot of people, we had some people to uh, join us and a lot of people have been impacted uh, by what we do because we're reaching out, you know, hey, uh, we got to start the initiative, mm -hmm. you know, and it starts with the heart. That's where, it's, that's where everything starts. And when, and when that starts in your heart and it's going, to lead, it's going to lead you to take action and then you get positive results. So that's what's been happening. So for the past four years, um, it's been growing. I've, I've seen families, communities coming together more, especially when we have the annual block party. Right. You know, we have that and that was the kicker right there. I mean, it brought everybody together. You know, they talk. You know, that's where it started, that conversation. You know, talking about the hard topics, then finding solutions for change. So, 
Briefly, so, we do want to address something that, that you have both alluded to, um, you know, police relations in the community. Yeah. Again, we, of course, every community has issues, but ours here, um, at least on the surface, seem much less um, mm -hmm. of a conflict between the police and communities of all races here. Um, what do you think at these events that you're doing right to, as you say, you're bringing the whole community together? What do you think people are walking away with after events like that? And why do you think that could be a positive um, relationship building thing in the community? I think they're walking away with, with um, the understanding of how important for a community to be, how to uh, build relationship, what's the importance of building relationships. And I believe that's what people are taking away from, from when we have those block parties and settings like this and stuff. So I, I think that's what people are taking away because I'm seeing it for myself. I'm seeing better relations with the community and police when you had little black kids was afraid of police. Sure. You know, they were afraid. I was at one time. And I never forget because of one act of Rex Mueller, one act he did right by me because I saw police different. I didn't like him. But he changed my whole perspective when he did that one act. You know, and so it changed my whole perspective. And Chief Mueller uh, wanted to be with us this evening. Uh, he and others from our community are in Iowa City tonight at a statewide diversity conference as they've been invited to speak about some of the growths that have happened locally here in right. Siouxland. But I did get a chance to sit down with him earlier this week and we talked about that and a few other things as we sat down and discussed the relations inside our community. We have not been afraid to put ourselves out there and to take criticism and self-reflect and see how we could get better and uh, we still do that. We're highly critical of ourselves and there are some in the public who are critical of us. Some of it deserves, some of it not. Um, but I don't think anybody is as critical uh, of our department as we are because we want to improve. We want to be good for the community. We want to serve all those roles that they want us to. Uh, so overall I think people see that and they understand that and they are supportive of this department, which is what we appreciate. I think we get a lot more done when we work as a, as a partnership as opposed to uh, opposing sides, which we are not. Uh, our officers, our department, we're in the community, we live in the community. So it, uh, we want to take care of this community. These discussions have been brought to the forefront because of recent activities in recent months in much larger cities than ours that have had much larger um, issues to deal with, I guess. But you did have a few. We did have a few small protests for a week or something. Did anything positive come out of those, do you think? I think, uh, I think some voices uh, were heard that we didn't know uh, existed, some opinions. Uh, the Finally getting very vocal support for body cameras was a positive thing and that was something that we had we had wanted and uh, uh, for a long time and I think that was uh, they made it loud and clear that this was something that the community wanted too, uh, which justifies the expense so there were good dialogues that were happening in that process and that's why positive protests uh, so that the message doesn't get lost I think when it's violence when it's chaos the message gets lost and, and uh, those people with legitimate concerns aren't heard and so keeping things peaceful and constructive was one of our goals through the entire uh, uh, time that we were dealing with protests. I know social media has been something that you've been able to add to your toolbox to mm -hmm. help uh, in enforcement and investigation, but as we've talked before, I know that can be as negative as it is positive. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit, how instantaneous sure. social media impacts the bridges that you can build? You know, social media is a positive tool for us in sharing and communicating with the community, but there is a very negative dark side to that. And that's the thing I worry about the most is that uh, people will throw a grenade in the, in the middle of the group and, and uh, you know, a bombshell that uh, may not be true and it, and it damages relationships uh, because we work really hard at building relationships. So when these things happen, uh, yeah, there's bridge building. And uh, the positive thing, though, is that we're, we don't say that the bridges are built and we're all good. We're constantly seeking to maintain relationships, build trust, get out in the community. Obviously, you're going to have some um, rebuilding to do after COVID. How has that impacted what you've been trying to do in the community? COVID has been 
terrible for us because we have now become disconnected with the very people that we serve. We can't be with them as often. We don't have these community policing events and outreach events. Uh, there's a limited opportunity to do so safely. And so uh, because of that, I think we've lost touch with the very people that we care about and that we serve. And so as we hopefully find our way out of COVID, that's going to be a major goal of ours is to reinvest ourselves in connecting with the people that we serve. In moving forward, it's, it's got to be, we have to continue to put the microscopes on ourselves and say where, see where we're doing well, uh, but then look at our deficiencies and be willing to move forward and make changes to address those. Again, those comments from earlier this week from Sioux City Police Chief Rex Mueller. And Dr. Chandler, I want to turn to you. Talked about social media there. Uh, you're on a college campus with thousands of young people. Uh, you probably are more aware of the social media aspect of oh, yeah. all of this than any of us. How does that play into race relations inside a college campus? So I, I think there are definitely some negative aspects of social media that we see, especially on the college campus. You know, there are students who may make a joke or post a meme or, or say something because they're trying to get likes or they're trying to go viral. And of course it's not friendly, it's hurtful um, and it's negative for the community. And I think all universities, including my own, have mixed success in responding to those incidents and especially meeting the needs of impacted communities uh, when those things happen. But um, I, I don't know, I tend to not focus on the negative aspects of social media. I, I think that the, the trolls and the negativity mm -hmm. gets a little bit more attention than it, than it deserves. Um, social media has been an incredible social movement tool. You know, when we think about the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, I mean, these are both movements that had their start in social media. And so they're a tool for people who, you know, perhaps for young people who live here in the Midwest who are openly gay or trans or they're people of color and they may live in a community where they don't necessarily feel like they have the support that they need, they can find that community through social media. And it's played that role for me in my own life. Um, and even when you look at the Black Lives Matter movement, that was a letter that uh, Alicia Garza wrote to black people in the aftermath of uh, Trayvon Martin's murder. And a friend of hers took that phrase and put a hashtag in front of it and, and a movement was born. So I, I tend to think about, you know, the power that it has to really bring people together and, um, and to fuel these movements going forward for, to create change. And you led me to my next question. Um, and this is for all of you. The, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of the protests that we've seen nationwide, there have been um, smaller versions of that right here in Siouxland. Uh, maybe just talk about your experiences with that, the people that you work with. Um, do you find that being part of these movements is helping um, in the community as far as race relations goes? And again, I'll open this to all of you. I've never seen anything like this, you know, I, I think. Um, and, and there have been some reports that up to 26 million people around the nation have participated in protests um, in response to the death of George Floyd. There's something um, really powerful and really uh, important and unique about this moment. Um, and, you know, I think that it's sometimes we say here that, well, things seem fine. We don't have the problems that exist in other places. Um, but this is what happened to George Floyd is not um, unique. It is a story that you could tell about different cities all around the country um, and tell it in very similar ways and it has very similar outcomes. And so I think that that's something that resonates for people. And it's telling us something about um, you know, lingering feelings or resentments or emotions that exist in our communities. And, I, and again, I think that that's an opportunity um, that we should address and, and, and come together to do better, a better job. Mm -hmm. Cliff, go ahead and jump in. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I know you had a mm -hmm. firsthand look at what happened here in our community for mm -hmm. uh, three or four days inside of a week. The, the Chief Mueller talked about there were positive right. things that came mm -hmm. out of that. How do you see that? I see it uh, as a positive because what I see in these protests is, first of all, I see the young people. I commend those young people. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about all across the nation because they are doing it big, and I'm seeing diversity. Uh, and out of that, I'm seeing I'm seeing some um, uh, other movements uh, being spawned out of it. You know, uh, and I, I think it's just great. But yeah, the protest has has been good. Everybody coming as one because uh, when you're one. I mean, you can move mountains when you come together as one. So I'm, so it, it, the protest is really good. I spoke at a Black Lives Matter protest, uh, not a protest rally at Cook Park. I think it was last month, month before that. And I just saw how people just come together, you know, and, and, and you know, find the solutions for change. 
So I think a lot of positive came out of that. To your point, I think the ones here in this region are so positive because mm -hmm. they have been people genuinely caring about the movement right. and they're peaceful. Um, right. So their message is you know, very clearly being heard in right. a way that seems very constructive. And I'll open mm -hmm. it up um, to you as well. Um, and it's been really positive to see young kids, like I said, come together. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just about um, what happened with, jo um, with George, it's that it's a whole cultural trauma, yeah. and especially yes. with the mental mm -hmm. health, you know. It's not about that this incident happened. You, like uh, like Dr. said, it happens all the time in, in big cities, but I think it was like the, um, the drop. Like, we need to do something. We need mm -hmm. to step in, and, and those teens, and, um, People of color are stepping and saying, no more. We need to mm -hmm. be together. We yeah. need to unite to do something. Yeah. Chief Mueller said in his comments that we need to continue to look yes. what more we need to do. Um, so I'd open that up to all three of you. What, as we move forward, would you throw out there? We are lucky here that we do have a loving community that, for the most part, mm -hmm. see, uh, is able to sit together and work through things. There are exceptions to that, obviously. But what do we need to do then to continue to close that gap, I guess I would say? I would say continue, continue to reach out continue to have these conversations, continue to participate in, those, in the meetings. Con, you know, we got to continue. Yes, there's been some bridges been torn down, but we got to continue to build it up. We got to continue to maintain those relationships. We got to maintain the talk, maintain the listen, keep listening. You know, so we got to keep doing what we're doing like we did before, you know, even, even more, you know. And uh, I think a lot of positive will come out of that. We'll see the fruits of it. It's, it's work. It's going to take work, but it's doable. I agree with that. I think relationships are, are a very important part of it. You know, police officers should have good relationships in the communities mm -hmm. where they work. They need that to do their jobs effectively and to do it well. Um, but what I've found, you know, now that things, uh, and they haven't, they haven't slowed down everywhere, right? But um, as things slow down here, I think people are, you know, taking that moment of mobilization from the protests and are, are moving into action. What mm -hmm. kind of concrete actions yeah. can they take in their communities? And for me, I think relationships are an important part of it, but it also has to be about accountability and transparency. So Chief Mueller, you know, mentioned uh, cameras. You know, that, that's a very important issue. Um, access to the video on those cameras is mm -hmm. important. Who has the final say? Is, it, is that video readily available to the public? Or is the chief able to say, when or, or, or when it's released or not. Um, you know, I think that uh, when we talk about issues of police violence and police brutality, accountability really is the core issue. You know, when I go to my job every day, I know that I'm going to be accountable for my outcomes, I'm accountable for my relationships. Um, and one of the reasons that this is such a recurrent problem in so many communities around the country is that there really isn't that accountability and transparency mm -hmm. that is needed in the relationship between law enforcement um, and the communities where they work. And so, you know, I think it's even a matter of looking at, you know, what are the contracts that cities sign with fraternal orders and police departments? What um, is the re internal review process? Is there community input? Um, you know, how is a police officer reprimanded for misconduct? I, I think those, mm -hmm. you know, actually looking at policies and standards is really where this conversation needs to move. And I think given the opportunity to people to express how they feel, they might be angry, they might be, that's the way they feel, and we cannot shut it down. Yeah. We can't. We need to give them the opportunity to voice their, their opinion mm -hmm. and, and to listen. I think mm -hmm. what I heard yeah. uh, Cliff saying, just listen what we can do, be in that table, being um, open to the changes. What mm -hmm. can we do yeah. different and, and make that action change? You know, it's not going to be easy mm -hmm. and, it's like gonna, and it is going to be an overnight, but we need those changes. And we've addressed the police. What do you think, uh, bringing it to Siouxland's next generation? the children, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think can be better done in schools? Um, because a lot of where kids develop their interpersonal relationships or their ideas of race or genders, things like that, that happens in the classroom um, for many hours, five days a week. And now, of course, things are online because mm -hmm. coronavirus, but mm -hmm. still, um, what do you think can be better done in schools to build those relationships? I think um, if, a, if, if a child has a problem or whatever, I think there needs to be accountability in the schools as well with the staff and, and administration. And I think they need to listen more mm -hmm. to when children cry out, when they have a problem. I got a problem with bullying. Somebody didn't call me the N word, somebody didn't did that, but nobody's hearing me. So I think, I think a part of that, I know it's a lot more, but a part of that, the, the, the administration needs to listen to the children when they're hurting 
and need not only listen, but do something about it. Thank yeah, that, that's really the heart of it, I think, that there is a tendency that if a, if a child is acting out, mm -hmm. um, it's considered a problem, right, rather than trying to understand the source mm -hmm. of that behavior. Um, and so I think that there just needs to be a lot more of empathy and understanding yeah. in the way that we deal uh, with youth and, and that there isn't a benefit for those young people or for their communities for there to be a direct line between our schools and a prison system, right? If, if someone is misbehaving and then they're sent to detention. Um, and there's also uh, disparity in that as well so um, you know I, I think that the way we deal with that is is um, perhaps not having the presence of law enforcement in schools yeah. um, and having more empathy uh, towards youth who are there. And Renee you probably have as good a view of that as anyone here tonight in your role as a therapist at Catholic Charities. Mm -hmm. How would you relate to that to the stories that you've heard from young people that mm -hmm. that turn to you? Right and a lot of times what happened is um, you guys said it correctly is about they, I told someone and nobody listened mm -hmm. to me. I, I, um, I said it so many times or I, the only safe place that I had was in school, but then later on it was not safe no more to talk about it. Um, it is, you know, one counselor cannot see a hundred kids, you know. We need more of, you know, maybe teachers be more empathetic, more, you know, um, help. And I know they're busy already, but have somebody specific, you know, or more people within the mental health that they can refer, that they can t um, uh, send so they can talk and they can be listened. I'll build mm -hmm. on that further. What do you think parents could do at home um, more? Because, of course, they are... I Probably not the right word choice, but the first line of defense, you know, with their children, because if, if the parents aren't listening, then maybe the child feels that they can't speak up to a teacher because, you know, that takes more for, for a kid to go to someone that's more of a stranger. What do you think parents can work on with their kids at home um, to build, you know, understanding and just a better realization of what's going on? I would think, I think uh, for me, from my experience, when my, when my daughters had uh, uh, some issues, I, I learned to listen to them. I learned to listen and I, and, and I let them express themselves. And then uh, me and the wife come up with a plan on how to deal with that and teach them how to deal with this type of stuff. You know, so I th and a lot of it starts from the home because if the, if the parents not listening to the children at home and then they go out and try to tell somebody else, they don't listen. Okay, now their trust is broken. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna go to nobody anymore because they go have it. I've been there. Nobody's ni listening to me, so they go to act out in different ways I'm, uh, to get somebody's attention. Whereas uh, doing this or or do something to go to jail or what, whatever. But I think the parents uh, should talk to talk to the children and listen. See, we we got to learn to listen. You know, we can't be so quick to just seems talk to be your it. message for the yeah, evening. What is yeah. some of that mm -hmm. advice? Do you have anything that you'd like to share with our with our viewers and everyone watching at home? What uh, What is some of the advice that you would have given your daughter in, in any situation like uh, that? I would uh, listen. I would uh, give them, teach them on how to deal with situations like that. Conflict resolution. Right. Yeah. Conflict resolution. I teach them how to deal with it without violence, peacefully. OK, you can express yourself or whatever. But this is how you deal with this peacefully. You know, and, and you, you speak your mind and respectfully and all of that type of stuff. So. Let me flip the coin, Dr. Chandler. It's good to listen, but how important it is that we as adults ask mm -hmm. what the situation is, how you're feeling, how yeah. can I help versus waiting. If you think about a youngster, right. how difficult <laughs> is it for yeah. a youngster? I think back yeah. to when I was no, young, it was hard to say, hey, I need help. Mm -hmm. Do we need to ask more as adults? Yeah, what Absolutely. signs to look out for too? Exactly. You know, I, even with the students that I work with, you know, I can I can tell when there's something going on, right? I, I can tell when it's something personal. If it's someone they have a crush on, if they're having you know <laughs> difficulties in class, um, you you can often tell just in the way that they're behaving, right? Um, and and know how to ask those questions. But I think on this issue, you know, I might take a little bit of a different view. I, I think that um, what leads to better outcomes is, is opportunity and equity and security for families. And so, um, you know, I, I think parents are having these conversations with their kids. I, you know, I don't, I don't think that um, these conversations aren't happening. I, I know that black families are talking with their children about, you know, look, look this is something you have to look out for when you go mm -hmm. out, um, you know, being stopped by a police officer, you know, being mindful of, of um, how you're seen by the people around you. I, I think these conversations are, are already happening. Um, and, you know, if we want better outcomes for these families, we have to make sure that they live in communities where there are opportunities that will provide security for them. So. Thank you.
And one of the things is that, like I said, you know, families are talking about it, but we need, you know, people who are not people of color to stand up as well and talk about it. You know, if you, uh, if they're making a racial joke and you don't say anything, you're part of the problem mm -hmm. as well. You know, say something about it, stop it right there and talk about it. We've got to wrap up here in just a couple of minutes, but I have, want each of you to have one more chance here. As we, as we finish things up here in your guts, do you feel good about where we're headed? Are you optimistic or are you really uh, bothered by where we're headed in the next months and, and years? Renee, we'll start with you. I want to say that um, I think we're in, I'm not saying we're there yet, but we, we are in the process. And that's what um, I think we, we could need to continue to talk. I think we, if we get those teens involved in these um, talks, we can learn from them. Um, it changes from day to day how I feel about it. Uh, I, I think that we have an incredible opportunity. I think people are more willing, um, are more open to listening to different experiences and believing those experiences, not necessarily questioning them, which is good. Um, but you know, I, I definitely want to see more people um, willing to, to get to work, right, and focus on changing laws and policies, voting in people uh, who will support those strategic actions. And um, as long as I see more of that happening, I think I'll feel better. Yeah, Cliff, I'm, you get the final word. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I am very optimistic, and I agree with both ladies. I'm, I'm optimistic. As uh, long as we keep heading in the right direction, staying on that same direction and working together, I think that will have a great impact. I want to thank you, and I know you echo my thoughts. Thanks very much Absolutely. for spending part of your evening, taking time from your personal lives to, to be with us tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for you. joining us. Of course, uh, 30 minutes just isn't very <laughs> long, by. that is for sure. It doesn't really get to the tip of the iceberg as far as the things that we've talked about here tonight. There is much more that can be done. That's right. And KCU9 will continue the conversation. You can join us right now. You can go to our website, to our Facebook page. You can join the conversation going on right now on this story. So, again, we'd like to thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you to our panel. Thank you to our viewers. And thanks for watching, Siouxland. Good night.